Okay, so it's, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, next speaker, uh, Mr. Tom Vulture Lawhead, a, a, quick, uh, a quick Vulture analogy that I think is actually maybe pretty good here. So when I was growing up, my dad used to have this cartoon picture in his office. And it was, uh, you know, it's one of these uh, lone trees in the desert kind of thing, you know, one, you know, one, uh, uh, one uh, branch. And on the branch, there were two vultures uh, sitting on the branch, and uh, one vulture's talking to the other, and it says, uh, I'm tired of waiting, let's go kill something. And so uh, when I think of Air Force Futures and what Secretary Kendall is asking us to do with operational imperatives, it always reminds me of that, right? Because in the end, I think that's a little bit what Secretary Kendall's right, uh, message to us is, right? We, we got to stop waiting, right? Let's go figure out how we kill something. And so uh, Vulture, as our leader of Air Force Vulture, uh, Futures, has really been charged with the analytics behind figuring out, right, what is the right thing to do. Uh, really has a huge part in the operational imperatives. I think a great speaker to lead us through, and also th how we think, Colonel Ford, to your point about capability development planning. So, uh, Vulture, over to you. Thanks. All right, good afternoon. Thanks, General Morris. Uh, super excited to be here, have this conversation. Uh, Interesting to be the uh, cleanup hitter here, if you will. You know, an hour from now, we can have a discussion on whether I was actually the, the cleanup hitter and successful, or was I the cleanup sweeper behind the circus parade and the elephants. So we'll, we'll see where this goes. Uh, I, what I'd like to do is kind of offer uh, the operational side of the imperatives, how we got there, why we got there, and then a few lessons learned uh, along the way. Uh, I will note before I forget that uh, I brought swag for you. It's not stress balls, it's not totes, it's not keychains, uh, but up on the front desk here is a uh, one page front and back uh, unclassified uh, placemat for the operational imperatives. Kind of lays out the situation, uh, the challenge, and the approach for each of the seven operational imperatives. So, might be of interest. Uh, so, why? Why do we care? Why are we going to this effort on the operational imperatives? And as, as you've heard over the last several days, uh, both in WDI and, and LCID, uh, it's because of the threat that's out there. The peer adversary that we're facing uh, continues to increase range of their weapons, lethality of their weapons, capacity of their weapons, and mo most importantly, in grouped, uh, the ability to achieve their wartime objectives regardless of what we do. That's the overall imperative, if you will, for the operational imperatives. Uh, so what is changing? The risk is changing. As we look at our peer adversaries, China and Russia, uh, they are, we are increasing risk across the, the spectrum with them. We're increasing the risk uh, of maintaining our space superiority. We're increasing the risk of being able to gather and mobilize and deploy forces where and when we need to. Uh, we're increasing risk uh, to the ability to generate the number of combat sorties that we have to generate uh, to deny their objectives. And we're increasing risk uh, to getting to and fighting in that highly contested environment. Uh, these risks are unacceptable because without facing and, and surmounting those risks, we lose. To Dale White's point, uh, the reason we do this is to win. But what does winning look like? We'll talk a little bit about that uh, in detail, uh, but even winning is not a good thing. If you can imagine a, a cross Taiwan Strait war, uh, when we win, and prevent China's objectives of seizing Taiwan, we still lose carriers and other surface combatants and all the people on them. We still lose whole air bases and a good portion of the airmen on them. Uh, we lose Army and Marine Corps fighting positions and the Marines and soldiers on them. And that's a, that's a, that's a win. Okay, so, and potentially decades of economic impact to the globe. That's a win. 
So more importantly, the force that wins in that environment is also the force that deters prior to any conflict. So if we want to win, we also want to deter. The force that wins is the force that deters, and we would like to never have that fight. So every morning when President Xi gets up, we'd like him to open his curtains, look out and go, eh, not today. And we want to continue that. And that's the sense of urgency that the SECAP has given us for the operational imperatives. It's the sense of urgency that we have to continue this capability development to get us to the force of the future and the joint force of the future that is able to deter our peer adversaries and, the, and survive against that, that uh, increasing threat. So what are we doing about it? You may have heard of the joint war fighting concept. Start out at 1.0. Now, surprisingly enough, we went to 2.0 and we're actually working on uh, the JWC 3.0. That is uh, directly uh, focused on winning this peer fight specifically and across uh, Taiwan Strait uh, fight. It's aligned with the national defense strategy. It's aligned with defense planning guidance. All the joint services are aligned with that warfighting concept, and that's key. Uh, you can think back to air land battle and not everybody was maybe on board with ALB. All the services are on board with the joint warfighting concept. It is where we are going. It is the future force we need. And from an internal look to the Air Force side, it is where our future force design is focused at getting to. It is where our Air Force future operating concept is focused on operating and how we get there. Underneath the joint warfighting concept is these four supporting concepts. We can go into them uh, afterwards uh, if you want more specifics. Uh, with specific concept required capabilities. And as we look at those concept required capabilities that are spelled out, uh, we see where the gaps are. Those gaps from an Air Force perspective are exactly what the SECAF looked at and said these are the critical imperative gaps that we have to fill, hence the operational imperatives. So that's where we got this first tranche of seven operational imperatives. Those are the critical gaps in the concept required capabilities to fulfill the joint warfighting concept. So we've tested the hypothesis, we've tested the future force design uh, to see if it actually wins in the JWC. Uh, future Games 22, Future Games uh, 23, that'll be next uh, January, actually takes the Air Force, uh, Future Force Design, war games it in a uh, joint warfighting concept scenario against representative threats and sees uh, how it does and what we need to tweak. Most recently, this spring in May, uh, General Highnote, uh, Air Force Futures uh, Director, uh, led uh, the Globally Integrated War Game, which is a joint staff, uh, Five I, so with allies and partners, uh, war game in that same war fighting scenario. And we found that that future force and the joint war fighting concept, when we are able to fight in all domain, fight with our allies and partners, wins in that scenario and prevents our adversaries uh, meeting their objectives. Key point there is that with our allies and partners. So we talked in the previous panel about the comparative, the comparative advantage we have in propulsion. I would offer that one of the great comparative advantages that we have that our peer adversaries do not have is our allies and partners. I include in allies and partners our industry partners. Granted, uh, they have a very uh, tight coupling between their government uh, and their industry, but I would say that the brain trust that we have in industry, the brain trust and the capability that we have within our allies and partners is and will be critical to the future warfighting effort. So, given that capability gap analysis of the joint warfighting concept and the SECAF direction, uh, 
The OIs started out as a sprint, and important to note, this was a sprint to figure out what we could get after in the, and insert into the FY24 pump. I, I could not agree more with all that's been said about this coupling between the acquisition uh, professionals, the requirements professionals, and the resourcing professionals, as well as industry, to get after this. That's really what we do in capability development, and what we need to continue to do is that, that trinity between requirers, acquirers, and resourcers has to continue. Sprinkle over the top of that the analytic rigor that uh, SAF uh, studies and analysis brings and the other anal analytic branches uh, in all the services, and that helps us get after that uh, force that we need. Uh, the sprint nature of the OIs, while focused initially on the FY24 POM, uh, will continue on. You'll see uh, as POMs get revealed. We've made a down payment on the operational imperatives, but the operational imperative work itself will continue. It'll be folded in uh, to multiple other uh, capability development uh, planning efforts, and we'll continue to do that. So let's talk a little bit about the operational imperatives uh, themselves from an operational perspective. Next uh, slide, please. So on the chart, kind of the one-liners on what exactly is the title and the one-liner for each of those operational imperatives, but let's talk a little bit about what that means. On the space side, we cannot afford in the future fight to lose control of space. We need to be able to bring effects to space, from space, and in space. We need position, nav, and timing capability. We need communications capability. We need data transport capability. And we must have that as a joint enabler for the future war fight, period. On the ABMS, Advanced Battle Management System side, this uh, is a critical effort. And really, two, three, four, even five, if you will, all kind of get lumped together in my mind as one big mosh pit of uh, capability. But ABMS itself is that critical ability uh, to sense, to make sense, and to bring effects to the battle space at a time and place of our choosing. If you think back from uh, post-Desert Storm into, and certainly post 9-11, we've had the luxury in the counter VEO fight to put exquisite ISR up over potential targets, orbit for hours, sometimes days, pick up kind of life trends, specify targets, talk about what would be the best shooter and the best weapon against that target, and ultimately make a command and control decision, yeah, go ahead and schwack that, that target. We have to have a battle management system that can scale to thousands of targets in hundreds of hours, making near real-time decisions, and Think, if you will, a battle management system that can take information from a space sensor, get it down to an Army long-range fire shooter who fires a surface-to-surface -surface missile that's now moving at hypersonic speeds, that gets an in-flight target update from a Marine Corps fighter that then hits a target and we get real-time battle damage assessment from some other weapon, some other sensor in the battle space, and that comes back to command and control authorities as well as the rest of the fleet so that they understand from a battle space situational awareness standpoint whether that threat is up, it's down, it's at least been rendered unfunctional and then we can continue operations. 
So that is not a simple solution, either from an architecture standpoint, as General Genetempo real knows, uh, very well knows, uh, or uh, from a doctrinal standpoint. So think about for a minute, who's doing the C2 of that specific battle management? Who owns that space sensor, that army shooter, that marine in-flight target updater, and the battle damage assessment capability on the back end of it. Uh, this is not trivial, and I think uh, next to uh, OI-5 and base resiliency, this is probably our, our toughest nut to crack uh, going forward, and it'll probably take us the longest to kind of morph up to that full capability. Next, uh, you've heard uh, Dale White talk about uh, the NGAD family of systems, and one of the key uh, takes out of that is, is that we believe that uh, uh, collaborative combat platforms uh, or combat aircraft uh, will be part of that family of systems to increase volume of fires, to increase lethality, and to increase effectiveness on the, on the battlefield. And uh, we are working to develop and field those CCAs and we will continue uh, to specify what that means and how it will be employed. And again, back to the kind of dot mil PF side of this, you know, while we have uh, uncrewed platforms today, we are going to be using them in a completely different fashion, which will require us to potentially organize differently, certainly train differently. Uh, potentially deploy differently, and certainly employ differently. Alongside us, we talked about battle management and uh, the NGAD family of systems. Uh, inherent in those and in the, uh, the long-range kill chain uh, piece of the OIs is the weapons themselves. So by and large, uh, the weapons we are developing currently uh, have the right capability we need. There are some uh, changes we'll make uh, around the margins and some potential additions in terms of weapons, but capacity will be critical to the future fight. And frankly, uh, we are not producing at capacity, not near enough capacity uh, for the future fight, and we must, we must do that. Uh, we've uh, flip-flopped uh, the OI order from, from this chart to where they sit number-wise now, but moving target uh, engagement at scale uh, is a critical piece. And we've pasted out in the uh, OI work uh, the mission engagement thread for the long-range kill chain, or kill web, if you will, and where the critical gaps are in that long-range chain, and are, we are getting after that. Calm data transport, sense and sense making are uh, critical to those efforts as well. We'll also look at uh, how we get moving target indications and how we actually uh, maintain target custody over time uh, in that battle space so that we can in fact track targets uh, from uh, the air or the surface potentially from space, both uh, moving uh, surface targets as well as airborne targets, uh, and maintain combat ID, maintain custody of those targets to seeker width of whichever weapon we need to pair against those targets. Uh, that, again, is another tough nut uh, to crack, but we're going after it. Uh, and I'd, I'd say I think uh, Mr. Hunter uh, mentioned a little bit about uh, any sensor, uh, any shooter, and I would just refine that a smidge uh, in the long-range kill chain. It should be the right sensor to the right shooter with the right weapon for that particular target. And that's what we're trying for. I think uh, foremost in Secretary Kendall's mind uh, and probably his biggest concern is the resilient basing sustainment and communications in a contested environment. Uh, that is one OI that is uh, keeping him up at night. Uh, I think anybody who's ever deployed to a main operating base uh, lived out of it 
uh, went to their aircraft at the same spot every day uh, to, with the same weapons load barn, with the same weapons and ammo dump, uh, with the same fuel uh, supply areas, uh, knows that that is a ripe target and not, uh, you can get that target from Google Maps. Uh, so this is not a difficult targeting uh, situation for our adversaries and one that we have to we really have to think hard about. Part of this will be agile, agile combat employment. So let's make the targeting uh, of our adversary more difficult. Part of this will be pre-positioning as we move out from hubs to spokes. Uh, part of this will be pre-positioning of assets. But what are the right things we need at those places? How do we get it there either before conflict or during conflict in what might not be highly contested, but certainly will be contested airspace? Uh, how do we resupply? How do we infill and exfill? And, and how do we continue ops and generate sorties, uh, that logistics under attack piece that must, uh, must occur? Uh, at those particular bases or anywhere we're located, in addition to preposition, in addition to dispersion outside the base, we need to think about dispersion on base. We need to think about camouflage. Some of these old concepts that were second nature in the Cold War are now coming back. Camo, deception, and concealment. Those are going to be part and parcel of the way we fight the war of the future. I'll talk uh, now about uh, the B-21, the family of systems. Uh, so initially we were kind of thinking that this would parallel uh, NGAD and the family of systems. Uh, I think we've thought a little bit differently about this and we're taking, uh, I'll, I'll say an operational pause on the family of systems piece of the B-21. We're concentrated mostly on what is the right weapons uh, load for the B-21, what are the right effects we need and when actually will uh, we need and how best to use uh, the B-21. So that would be uh, critical to us, but we will need that ability to penetrate in the highly contested environment. We will need it to be survivable, and we will need to bring volume of fires uh, to those engagements. So we will continue it. Uh, finally, uh, OI-7, uh, the readiness of uh, the Department of the Air Force to transition to a war, uh, wartime footing. Uh, really, uh, with General Hawk as the uh, lead, uh, worked a lot on the cyber side of that uh, transition and how do we protect our networks that mobilize and deploy uh, and generate forces? How do we get them in theater? Uh, what we are now thinking about is whether we add on to OI-7 for the mobility piece and the air-to-air -air refueling side of this. So do we have the mobility forces we need? Do we have the air refueling forces we need? Uh, to be able to get into theater, to be able to move around within theater, to be able to sustain and supply the forces, and that's the joint forces, not just the air forces uh, within theater. So that's, uh, that's what we're looking at on OI-7. Uh, you can see as, as we've had this discussion that the common thread, and you've seen it over the last several days, the common threads through these operational imperatives are communications, networking, and logistics. So either during competition and certainly during conflict, we will need to be able to command and control from CONUS, as we start to generate forces, we will need to be able to see to the forces as they move into theater. We will need to be able to command and control the forces as they disperse within theater. Uh, we will certainly need to be able to see to as we move into the area of operations and uh, deny enemy objectives, uh, say in a cross strait invasion. And we will need the networks uh, that allow us to do that the data links that allow us to move information, not just to crude and uncrewed platforms, to command and control platforms, back to the main operating bases, to forward operating bases, to Army fires positions, to uh, Marine uh, expeditionary uh, operations positions, 
uh, to in-flight targeting weapons in flight, and then drawing what information we can as battle damage assessment uh, from whatever uh, sensor in theater we can and bring it back to the C2. All of those communications uh, and networks uh, need to be uh, built. Uh, it is not going to come at, uh, hey, we're not going to wake up one morning and go, hey, all, everything we have is in place. We're good to go. We will be building on that throughout. The sense of urgency that General White talked about uh, to me means this isn't, uh, hey, we just need to have something out there by 2030. Uh, this is, we need to be ready tomorrow. So if I'm a fighter wing commander today, my forces need to be ready to deploy tomorrow. We, as requirements professionals, you as industry and acquisition professionals, logisticians, you need to be ready to go tomorrow. We need to be able to build to the best capability that we can uh, in this next few years, and then continue to work through those capability development plans, those roadmaps via acquisition strategies and the appropriate requirements documentation, and certainly uh, the correct resourcing to get us to the future force that we need that actually fights and wins in that battle space. So uh, lastly, uh, I'll comment on what are the OIs and maybe what, maybe more importantly, what the OIs are not, right? Again, I'll reiterate, the OIs were a short sprint initially to get to a FY24 Palm solution, particularly in the near years. What they uh, morphed into and what they will continue to be is a long-term capability development planning iteration on where are we today and where do we need to get to in the future? And what can we do right now so that again, every morning when President Xi wakes up and opens his curtains, not today, today's not the day. There is obviously, along those lines, a lot of work to do. What you'll see in 24 is a down payment on some of these. We'll continue to work that. Obviously, we don't even have a FY23 budget yet, so that will affect the near term. That will then affect what actually is going to happen in 24 to 27. So we will continue to iterate on these capability development plans to get to the force that we need. And, so we will all have to breathe through our noses for a couple more months, maybe several more months, uh, maybe until early spring, before we even know what FY23 budget actually looks like. So that will ripple through all of this. Uh, the enemy gets a vote. The threat will change. We will continue to iterate on these capability development plans. But one thing I do know is, as quickly as we can, we need to get capability into the hands of the joint warfighter and then be able to iterate and modernize and improve that capability to get out to the full capability that they need to fight that fight. So what the OIs are not, they're not the whole picture. Okay, you can't say, hey, we funded all seven operational OIs, they're fully funded, life is good, we don't need to do anything else. There are a ton of other concept required capabilities and foundational capabilities that both the Air Force, the Space Force, and the Joint Force need that are not nested inside the operational imperatives. So there's a whole other part of the Air Force that still needs to be funded. Think weapon system sustainment, think the fly an hour program, think test and evaluation. All of that still has to get both funded and planned so that it marches in pace with the specific efforts of the operational imperative. Uh, it's also, I think as we've talked about, uh, not a one and done. So the operational imperatives are not a one and done. Again, once, once I get them funded, life is good. These are living documents and we'll continue to develop those capability development plans. 
Lastly, I'd like to uh, finish up and then get into questions uh, with a couple of thoughts on uh, lessons learned from the operational imperative uh, sprint so far and the ongoing work. Uh, I talked uh, earlier uh, about uh, the criticality uh, of our allies and partners, and actually that discussion during the OIs has spawned a lot of conversation on, wow, wouldn't it be good if we could bring the allies and partners into this classified discussion, see what they can offer in that space, see what they're bringing to the war fight, and increase the overall joint force and coalition force capability. The good news is, from a security standpoint, uh, we have uh, broken down some doors, not all the doors, there are still some doors in the castle that need to be broken down, but we've broken down some of those security doors and started getting uh, the ability to have higher level conversations both uh, within the services, in Department of Defense, external to the Department of Defense, as well as with our industry partners uh, to have more fulsome conversations about what we need, when we need it, and how do we get there. Uh, one of the big lessons learned that we've got out of the operational imperatives, and we've talked about it in multiple panels already, is that collaboration is critical. Collaboration within the department, collaboration with industry, collaboration with the requirers, the acquirers, and the resourcers is critical. And even collaboration between the operational imperatives. So what we saw as the seven OI teams scattered out and did their collaboration. When we first brought the seven OI teams back in for briefing, uh, some of them were working on exactly the same things. So there's goodness there. So everybody's at least thinking alike, but there's some redundancy of effort that we need to prevent. And, and so that, there was goodness to see that, okay, we still have a gap and a seam over here between these OIs, but you guys are already working on closing that gap. That's good. But they're also working on closing that gap. Stop doing this, let them work on that. So that collaboration is key. It is a beautiful thing. If you think about that uh, Venn diagram of the acquirers, the requirers, and the resourcers, you know, the more and more that we can bring that Venn diagram into a single cylinder of excellence, uh, the better off we'll be. Again, sprinkle over the top of that the analytic capability that we need, sprinkle into that the solutions that industry will provide, and, and we are onto something that will bring us success. Uh, so that, to me, is uh, very exciting. And then lastly, I'll, I'll just touch base on, so, you know, what's next? I don't, I don't know. I imagine we'll use the term operational imperative for quite a while to come. Uh, I think, as I mentioned, we'll bring mobility in to the OIs, either as a separate OI or in addition to an add-on to OI7. Uh, we've already had, as mentioned before, uh, the missionary reviews with the secretary. Maybe EW becomes its own OI or it stays as a missionary review. Uh, to simple me, uh, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that we continue the collaboration and the discussion and the conversation and the hard work to build those capability development plans, to build those roadmaps that take us from today with getting capability in the hands of the joint war fighter as quickly as possible and then spiraling out of that into the full capability that we need late in, in this decade and into the 2030s. And that will be success. That is what winning is about. With that, I would love to answer any questions that you have. None? Okay. <clears throat> Sir, thank you for your comments. Ed Jesperson, Lockheed Martin. Recently, uh, Secretary Hicks 
conveyed in a memo the uh, executive responsibility for air base defense. Slight modification. I was wondering if you could comment on that as it relates to OI5 and air base defense. So are you talking about the Secretary's uh, acquisition authority bestowed on the Air Force for uh, cruise missile defense of the homeland? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I can't comment. No, I can't. <laughs> no, no, nothing about it. So uh, that is, uh, I'll say philosophically, uh, that is probably step one, uh, is the acquisition authority for cruise missile defense of the homeland. Uh, we are now obviously just starting to go, okay, how does, uh, how does AQ get their arms around all the service efforts? And, and when you're talking about cruise missile defense of the homeland, it's not just DOD, it's really whole of government. How do they get their arms around all of that acquisition effort? So that's, that work is ongoing. I would say uh, the next logical step would be Acquisition authority is one thing. Uh, do we want uh, an executive agent for the operationalizing of cruise missile defense of the homeland? Uh, and I think that will be a conversation that will be brought up uh, at the, the Joint Requirements Oversight Council with the vice chiefs and the vice chairman, uh, and probably soon to accompany that acquisition authority. Clearly, NORAD Northcom has kind of the C2 of the actual execution, but there's going to need to be in a dot mil PF organizing how do we get from just the acquisition of capability to the dot mil PF side of how we're going to organize, train, and equip to use that capability to hand it over to the combatant commander to execute that capability. So those are the conversations I think uh, we're going we're gonna to have. Now, I am very optimistic that as we define solutions for cruise missile defense of the homeland, that we will transport those solutions to base defense and you know, OI-5 and how that morphs into the future force. But it will be critical. Thank you for that question. Good afternoon, sir. So uh, just to talk about your agile combat employment, my name is Rick Sloop with Floor Corporation. Uh, we're one of your contractors on several of the uh, contract augmentation programs, AFCAP, LOGCAP. So also having been a civil engineer in the Air Force, growing up during the, the Cold War, and I remember the salty demo results. Uh, for those of you who are really old, no, can look that one up. Uh, but where do you see industry playing into this and how we're going to move forward on uh, getting these resilient bases, these outlying island hopping campaign as it, as it were. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, thanks for the question. That's a, that's a great one, um, which of course is uh, speaker parlance for give me a second to think about my answer, right? So I'll hit that in, in several areas. You know, since you mentioned uh, CE, the CE side of this, certainly there's a MILCON element to base resiliency. Can I build extra runways? Can I build runways that we can drop into that aren't necessarily FOBs or MOBs, but we can drop in there, gas up? How do I prepo fuel, weapons there, et cetera? So there's, there's kind of that piece. Uh, there is uh, a base defense piece to this and certain systems that would either, uh, you know, for a long time we've talked about uh, base defense as either inside the wire or outside the wire, and that distinction ha has blurred, even as we were in Afghanistan and now is, is not just blurred but kind of pushed off the map. So we will have to have that doctrinal discussion uh, within the Department of Defense on Who's responsible for what and how are we getting after it? Certainly, as we get into air-to-air uh, uh, -air cruise missile defense of the homeland, that might enlighten some of those conversations. But what does base defense of the future look like? What are our dispersal uh, capabilities uh, that are going to be out there in the future? Is there a place in the future force for 
uh, platforms that are, don't require 8,000 feet of concrete. So things like high-speed vertical takeoff and land, uh, eVTOL, uh, both from a combat capability standpoint and or uh, the ability to resupply, infill, exfill, uh, and uh, sustain the forces in the field, again, inside of the second island chain in a contested environment. So you may see things like that, and certainly uh, we've been talking a lot about that capability. I think the answer is, is all of that, in addition to material and non-material solutions for camo, concealment, dispersion, hardened, uh, hardening of uh, bases that we currently have, hardening of bases that we need to have, and concepts of employment. Good news is the major commands, both USAFE and, and uh, PACAF uh, in particular, uh, as well as Air Combat Command, who is kind of honchoing the effort and kind of collating all of the thoughts from the, the uh, theater commanders on <clears throat> the Agile Combat Employment uh, CONOPS, uh, is we're starting to hover on solutions that have a, a, a common centerpiece, if you will, of this is, uh, this is the, the Agile Combat Employment kind of centerpiece with regional spe uh, specificity for both PACAF, because different problem for PACAF, certainly than it is for US Air Forces in Europe. Uh, so they'll have their own uh, spice, if you will, on, on ACE. Uh, and that's uh, kind of where we're at and where we're going. Hopefully that answers your question, which is speaker parlance for that wraps me up. I think I had a hand up. In the back? Nope, she's waving off. Anything else? I will be around. So if uh, you've got any other questions, comments, uh, happy to uh, field them uh, down here after. I don't have to leave for a flight for uh, some time. So happy to chat later. Thank you for your attention. Really appreciate it. Again, General Morris, thank you so much for the invitation.